guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a special guest, Brian Cusco. He is a friend of Tom Nearing's who was on the show recently, and he's got a great uh, testimony of, of how he came to faith in Christ, and I'm excited to hear it. But before we get to that, I just got this email, and again, this all glory goes to God. This is not about me, but this stuff just like keeps me going. <laughs> It's so encouraging. I got an email from a guy and he, I'm not going to say his name, but he said, the subject is just a heartfelt thank you. And the message is, hello, Mr. Cook. I just wanted to let you know that I was blessed by your book, my book, A Change of Affection. It turned my life around. You opened my eyes to a different way of thinking. I was steeped in sin living in the Oaklawn area of Dallas the Oaklawn area of Dallas is like the gay area. So clear, obviously this guy was gay. Um, I, I even managed one of the old nightclubs on the gay strip, uh, which is where, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to go all the time to these gay bars in Dallas on that. It's called Cedar Springs is the street. And there's just like lines of gay bars. Um, I, I, I lived there for many years and loved Dallas dearly. I now live in Cincinnati, in the Cincinnati area where God brought me to glorify him. I'm sharing your book with many in my church. I just had to buy, I just had to buy more. I hope sometime to attend one of your talks. Again, thank you for your fantastic testimony. And I pray God blesses you and your ministry richly. I mean, again, this is not, this is all glory to God. I'm not taking any credit for this, but uh, when I get these messages and emails, it's just so, it just keeps me like, cause the world is so crazy, right? I mean, everything is so insane. And so it just, these kinds of, uh, encouraging emails keep me going. <laughs> so without further ado, let's welcome Brian Cusco. Welcome, Brian. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm glad to, glad you're here. Um, so Tom Nearing, our mutual friend, told me you had a great story of coming to Christ. I think it was, what, two years ago you came to Christ? Yeah, it's been a couple and a half years now. It's like end of September 2021. Wow. Okay, so let's back up. And where you, you were born in California, right? I was. I was born in Hayward, California. Hayward. And did you grow up in a Christian home or what, what was your family life like? No, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, my parents were both raised Catholic separately growing up. You know, both of their folks, like my grandparents, um, went to Catholic church. And from time to time, we go to like a Catholic mass or something with my grandma on Christmas or something. Um, but they definitely didn't raise us um, in that. I think since they, I think because of like how maybe strict Catholicism can be um, or, or whatever, whatever it was, whatever happened with them being raised Catholic, mm. um, they, they caused them to choose not to introduce anything like that to us as, as their kids. Um, and so, so no. growing up, did you, did you believe there was a God or, or were, you just weren't interested or. No, I, I, I was always looking, you know, as I look back, I, I know that I was always searching. I was always looking, I would climb literal mountaintops kind of looking and not, not knowing exactly what it was I was looking for. And I do that. Cause I go by myself often, many times. Like I remember the first time I was in Hawaii for a little bit, um, I went on this hike up to this waterfall with these buddies, and then I left them at the bottom of the waterfall, went past the waterfall, and went all the way to the top of the island by myself, where you can see 360 degrees around. Just because I don't know, that's I enjoy hiking. I like getting out there. But looking back, knowing now what I didn't know then was I was just looking for his presence. That's what I was looking for. I'd get to the top, and I'd feel like I could feel it up there, not knowing what it was necessarily that I was looking for. But he 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 would see me every time, just you know, like. Don't worry, I got you. you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> nice, like Moses on Sinai. He you just went up to the mountain um to see God. Well, and so through your life, what um what was I mean, how first of all, I mean, as people can see, there's there are rep there are reptile, there's snakes, snakes in the background. And <laughs> yeah, I know Tom and <laughs> which you. is really scary. People are gonna think it's crazy, but how did you how did that even become an interest of yours? Since I was a little kid, I mean, I, I really liked dinosaurs. I was really interested in dinosaurs. I had like dinosaur bed sheets and uh, like <laughs> my mom 
made me a custom like hand sewn dinosaur costume for Halloween that I wore several Halloweens in a row. Uh, just was really into dinosaurs. And then when I was four years old in that backyard in Hayward of our little apartment, there was a California king snake crawling through the grass. And my dad identified it as a California king snake, non venomous, and decided we could play with it a little bit and check it out. And it turned out that it was uh, the neighbor's escaped pet. And our neighbor was like this Hells Angels type of dude whose moniker was Snake, like his name was Snake. And so we brought him his snake back and in his living room, his living room looked like my, you know, this half a built out garage that I have right now. He had just, you know, dinosaur in my four-year-old mind. It was like dinosaurs. I was like, dad, this guy's living with dinosaurs. Why aren't we doing this? And my dad was cool enough to like, I think a couple weeks later, he came back home from work and had a, a pet snake for me. So four years old. Wow. And so when did you get, when did you start getting really serious about it? And, and, you know, what do you actually do with the snakes? Um, I bring them to educational shows. Like there's a little girl's birthday this weekend that I'll, I'll bring out there. I'm, I also breed them. So I, I got really into it after moving back from Hawaii. So I, I went to uh, play with a band in Hawaii in my early twenties um, through like my mid thirties, basically. So we're in Hawaii from Oh four and I, we moved back, I guess it was about 10 years. So like 2014, we moved back here. And when I was a kid keeping snakes, which I had the same snake from the age of seven until I was in my early 20s, um, I would just didn't really know many other people that did. And I just thought I was one weird kid that had snakes and so did everybody else. And and then I moved back from Hawaii and I told my wife, you know, I'm going to get snakes. And she had known me for years in Hawaii before we moved back to California, where we're both from. And so when I told her, like, oh, I'm thinking I'm going to get a snake, we moved back to the mainland. And she's like, what? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to what? I was like, a snake. I like snakes. She's like, what? Why? But so I, I, you know, internet all of a sudden, you know, keeping snakes, no internet. Then moving back from Hawaii to get into snakes again with the internet, I just like that world of snake keepers opened up. And I, next thing I know, I'm like friends with, um, you know, some of the biggest breeders in the country who are doing, you know, shows on Discovery Channel and stuff like that. And, and, uh, it just kind of boomed to, where I'm at today with a, a bunch of snakes and it's not what I do full-time. I'm not like breeding them full-time. It's more of a hobby for me, but starting YouTube and doing videos is where I connected with a bunch of people in the community. In fact, I was just in Dallas um, this weekend at a, one of the bigger reptile shows in the country, kind of doing videography work for different companies out there as well as myself and my own YouTube channel. Um, so really it just, the snakes are cool. I love the snakes. They're awesome. Um, which is not a, you know, it's not a common thought amongst people. But what I love even more today is how many people, you know, being interested in this has connected me with. There's a huge amount of folks. That I, I mean, I, I could go to most states, I think, and I would have a place to stay from all the people I've met through this industry and hobby. Um, and that goes for outside of the country as well. You know, I've gotten to travel with like Indonesia and Australia and different places like that just through this reptile is strange to most people reptile keeping hobby <laughs> well i mean have you tapped into the hollywood market where like you know because when i worked as a production designer for years like there were definitely times where we had to rent snake you know have snakes on the set or whatever for some sh photo shoot or whatever have you done that in hollywood I haven't. Um, I've got, which I'm not too far from you guys. I'm, you know, as you know, I'm in the same town as Tom. So just a few hours north of you guys. Um, I have a buddy down there. He goes by the snake father and he does do that. So I, I know people personally that, that do that. I just haven't tapped into that side of things. I think it's just, it's a little three far. hours. It's a little far. I I'm pretty happy up here in slow County. I think we're going to probably live out our lives here. Um, yeah. So, by the way, <laughs> Slow County is San Luis Obispo County, uh, if people don't know that. Right. Okay. So let's. So when you were in Hawaii, were you know was there anything that happened in Hawaii, or was were you kind of seeking still in Hawaii, or searching for God, or what was he on your radar? Obviously, not super hard because the band that I played with for a long time. When I first met them up in Washington, to, well, I met them at this school in L.A. called um, Musicians Institute. It's right there between Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard. On the yeah, I, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cool school. The cool thing about it is like people come, come from all over the world to check that place out. So I had friends from, you know, all kinds of different countries that I jammed with. And the guys that I clicked with the most were from Hawaii. But I didn't 
really stay like we all left the school i went back up to the bay area i got a job had a girlfriend and then these guys went back to hawaii but a couple years later they were looking for me because they wanted to start a band like found my found me by looking up my ultimately my grandmother's phone number in the phone book and they called her looking for me <laughs> and we started the band up in washington state and what i'm trying to say here is that that first moment when i got up there which was a whole journey just to get this is the way that it happened that i ended up going in the first place because i was like these guys are crazy i'm not going to washington i know i know i've spent nine months with these guys i'm not leaving my nice job and my girlfriend and my paid for apartment to go on this crazy journey and like leave all that behind and, and then my boss is like, actually, you're fired if you don't, you, so you better go. Um, <laughs> because he found out that this opportunity was popped up. He was like, you're not staying here in the warehouse with me. You are fired and you're going to go join this band. And if it doesn't work out, maybe you can come back and have a job. But as of right now, you have no job. So bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the first thing that we do when we get there, we go up in the little attic in the, this beautiful house in Washington. We start recording this song and it's called We Need Another Brother Moses. And there's so many different lyrics. I never really even somehow grasped, maybe there was too much cannabis in the air that I didn't really grasp, like how many God-inspired songs this band was was writing. And I mean, there's a song called Going to the Sky, talking about like going to the Father's light after you die. And all of that stuff just went. So that's my point in saying, I don't think- Was, I was it a Christian that. band? Was it a Christian No, band? not necessarily. There was definitely a Christian influence. Like, you know, looking back, I remember Adam, the lead guitar player, he was like, very much reading the Bible and um, looking at that stuff. And that, but then there's also the influence of like Rastafarianism in the reggae side of stuff. So there's, it wasn't a quote unquote Christian band, but right. there were definitely heavily Christ influenced lyrics in a good amount of the songs, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so when you got back to California, um, what, what happened then? How long did it take until you, had well tell us that like what, what led up to your conversion to or coming to faith in christ you know it was as i look back you know this hindsight's always more clear than the, as you're experiencing it he just kept putting people in my life that would get me closer and closer because i i was listening to you uh talking with tom today while i was working in here i didn't get a chance to finish that that podcast but um I was listening to it and it makes me wonder like how many people have that story of like having been molested as children you know because the more I hear people's stories like, wow, it's more common than I think. And that was part of my story, you know, when I was four years old and I didn't really know what to do with it at the time. And I'm still just kind of figuring out that if I talk about it, it really just like Tom has a big, Tom really turned me on um, to revelation 12, 11 and like how impactful that can be. So it's just one of those of several verses that are not, let me just read. I'll read. Do you know it by heart? Yeah. They overcame the blood. They overcame him talking about the devil, they overcame Satan um, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives not unto death. So to me, that last part sometimes makes me think a little harder. Is like, if I love my, when, what I'm thinking of is like, how I interpret that, I should say, is, you know, that that darkness that I had from four years old, I held on to that forever, you know, not even realizing I was four, you know, so I, I didn't really think about how much I was hiding myself, but I was like, as a kid, I wouldn't go on the playground when other kids were playing. I, I would wait, I would stay, stay with my mom. And then when all the kids were gone, then I would go out in middle school. I wore a hood through like all of middle school. So nobody could see me. And my interpretation of the end of that verse is that I was loving my life and not doing what the verse says, which is not loving your life unto death. I was like, I love, uh, love sounds weird for probably some people to think about, but like I was loving the idea of keep myself hitting so much that I was basically doing the opposite of what that verse is saying in revelation. I wasn't bringing my darkness and letting it get exposed to the light. So the Lord could take it and wash yeah. me clean and, and cleanse all that. I was holding on to it and hiding it. And I did that for most of my life. Um, so that, that was a big part of it. I think was just having all these little, little things like our, our folks, um, you know, we, I, I was blessed to come from a very good family. Like my folks were, very loving, caring, supportive. And a lot of my family's like that all the way through my aunts and uncles and grandparents. And, um, but everybody else that I knew growing up came from broken homes, like abusive parents, divorced parents, or more often both abusive and divorced. Um, and that was like all I knew of other people's families. I, I had one friend, one single friend growing up whose parents were together and, um, everybody else was just like coming from this, this broken place. And so I, I had this weird, like, like, wow, our family is strange. Um, <laughs> but 
as, as great as my family is, there was still that even within the family, like this, we don't talk about hard things that we don't, you know, it's those hard things. We just kind of gloss over them a bit, not, not ultimately, not entirely, but a lot. Like my parents got in a fight one time when we were young, my, my sister's really little. And like my mom, you know, my, maybe my dad stopped the car and she stopped, stormed off and my sisters were crying. I might've been crying too. I might've blocked it out. So I don't remember that I was crying, but I know for sure they were. <laughs> and then, she comes back, you know, my dad drives around a bit, goes circles around, picture back up. And it wasn't a huge deal, you know, by the, especially compared to like all the different things I would see from people's parents growing up. Um, but I just remember, I'll never forget them saying, okay, we're not going to tell grandma about this. You know, so there's this like mindset that was set in my head that we don't talk about hard things and we don't right. put these things out there. Um, when is, when did you, did you ever talk to them about this? No. And so I'm a little bit, I just shared it because I've been doing it more recently. You know, the first time I shared about it was actually one of Tom's uh, things where he invites people to share their stories at breakfast at, um, at Atascadero Bible Church. And that was the first time I actually said it to anybody else, which was only like a year and a half ago. Wow. And then, yeah. Um, so no, I hadn't, and I'm, I'm not worried, but only to protect them and not want, make them, you know, I don't want to, I want to honor my folks. I don't want them to feel bad by anything because it wasn't their fault you know they didn't know that just playing in the, the neighborhood area that little apartment complex we lived in that that could happen you know it's not like it was their necessarily negligence it was just like so i wouldn't want them to like hear this and and feel like oh what you know how could we not know this how could you how could you know if i didn't say anything to anybody and i'm just yeah. 40 years old how could you possibly know so um but it as i as i look back it's like I'm just actually kind of starting to process how not hiding that is God is going to use that to, for his glory, like Romans eight twenty eight. you know, um, we know that for those who love God, he works all things together for good for those that are called to according his to purpose. his purpose. Yeah. Um, so I look at that and it's like, I didn't even know how much it affected me. Like, that's that's what I was thinking about when you guys were talking. When Tom was talking, like he didn't even remember that it happened, or that girl that was sharing her story that you know, was having these visions or whatever of that happening to her, and not knowing where it was coming from. Um, getting that out there, letting him work through it, and like I was at this thing called Slow Serve last the weekend, a couple weekends ago, where the the church right here get, takes a bunch of students um, for the weekend. We go camping, and then we go out in the community and just serve the community. I mean, one of the things that the kids were doing was walking up and down or walking around town and asking businesses if they could clean their bathrooms and just doing things out in the community just to help out where they could yard work, going to, um, you know, retirement homes and like playing bingo with the folks and doing projects with them and just things like that. But back at the campsite on Friday night, I was asked to share my testimony, which was like the fourth time I've ever gotten to share my testimony, which seems like a lot in the last two and a half years. But that was the third time I said to somebody else, but it was actually like a hundred kids, you know, just sharing that part of my life and just kind of being vulnerable there. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do because I, I've been blessed to be able to share my testimony a number of times since I've been saved. Um, first time in Iowa, which is a crazy story. The second time at uh, Tom's breakfast thing, third time at a senior breakfast thing, which was really cool because getting to give those folks who are in that age like pop, most likely all having people that they're praying for, maybe grandsons or, or, you know, grandkids or people in their lives that they've been praying for their whole lives, yeah. hoping that God will reach out and touch them. I gave them that story because I, looking back, my grandmother had been praying for me my entire life. You know, she'd tell me that when I was younger or just throughout my life. And I didn't really know what it meant. I was like, oh, that sounds like she's being nice. You know, she's. It's I always mean, the is, grandmothers or yeah. the mothers. They're always right. the, pray, the prayer warriors. <laughs> totally. So, so she, before she passed last October, she had got to know me for two years, knowing, knowing the Lord and me be able to come to her house and like read scripture to her. And just like, so using that part, I always, I always pray. Like before we got started today, I sat here and prayed for a while about please Lord, whatever I say today, whatever it happens to come out my mouth, which is probably going to be a mess and jumbled, like, please use it for your good and for your glory so that it can help somebody um, in any small way possible. And so that third time I got to share my testimony with the seniors is I could just see in the faces and then also in the words that were fed back to me after I was done, like how much hope it gave them because they had pe people they were praying for. And, you know, all the darknesses I shared about in my life up to that point and how to never get, stop praying and never give up hope on what the Lord is going to do in somebody's life, even as though they seem so far removed 
from any possibility of ever coming to know Jesus while on this earth. <laughs> that it's not. That's like me. My family was praying for me for like 20, 30 years. I don't know how long, many, many years. And they never imagined I would come to, to Christ. Like, cause I was, you know, a gay guy living in Hollywood and like, they had no, they, I mean, my mother had faith. My mother had really strong faith and she, she knew it was going to happen. It was crazy, but, um, but my other siblings were just like in shock when, when I told them that I had become a Christian, I had become a born again Christian. Like, um, so anyway, go ahead. So what, what, um, and also, uh, I think I've said this before on the show, but when that happened to me, I think I was nine years old and I spent the night at a friend's, a classmate. I mean, it was, it was like the most innocent thing. Like I spent the night. Yeah. And it's weird. Like, I don't know why kids spend the night at each other's houses. It's the weirdest like phenomenon, American phenomenon. Um, and no kid should ever do that because it's, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. And um, mm -hmm. so I spent the night at my friend's house, the, my friend from school. And, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night and his father was molesting me. And mm. I, I kept that a secret because I didn't want to tell my parents because I, my dad was a lawyer, a lawyer. And I, I knew he would kill the guy. Like I, I knew, and actually he confirmed, <laughs> we talked like, I don't know, this was like 10, maybe 10 years ago. I talked to my dad about it and I said, dad, what would you have done if I had told you about this? And he said, I, I would have given this, you know, the guy two options, either turn himself in or dot, 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 like, basically have him killed. And I was like, that's why I didn't tell you because I didn't want to be responsible. You know, you have eight kids and I didn't want to be responsible for you going to prison and then like not having a father and no provider. Um, so yeah, it is that kind of experience as you know, I think I was talking to Tom about that too. It's like, it really does a number on you you know, when you're a kid and it's just, it, and it's kind of sticks with you for a long, like your, your whole life, even, and I've, I've gotten prayed over many, many times I've gotten, you know, I pray, I, I ask God to just, you know, take that, whatever that is, that, um, that kind of trauma away, you know, take it out of me. And I mean, it's mostly, you know, I don't really think about it anymore, but, um, it does, it's, it's a very strange, traumatic experience yeah so so how did you how did you end up what tell so tell us how how did you end up coming to christ like what happened you know it was uh i i need to i need to talk about a couple other things that that happened before there was uh as blessed as i was to be raised in a in a good family there was a lot of darkness that found its way in to my life um whether it was just through experiences with people in the neighborhoods I was growing up in, um, you know, drugs, drugs were, um, a large part of my life from the time I was like 14. It's the first time I smoked weed with somebody on the football team. And it didn't seem too crazy probably because I didn't even get high. It took me like eight times and it was finally a, like a bong rip and a, and a shot of Yukon Jack that finally like pushed me over to that edge. Where I was like, Oh wow. Okay. Now something's happening. <laughs> um, but I, I also had meth addiction for in my twenties, I actually got kicked out of the band at one point because they weren't about that. And I just, it was just something I was doing in the town. I didn't think about it at the time as much, but it, it grabbed me hard in meth for like a couple of years, um, which was wild. But was I, when I look back at these different things, um, also like having prison experience, like going, I was, when I was playing in the band, I was actually transporting large quantities of cannabis in my drum set that, that it started out as a little bit, but it ended up being a lot um, over time and, and doing that eventually. Finally, one time the, the uh, DA was waiting for me at HNL. And th at that, that was when my wife was, uh, pregnant, you know, she was six months pregnant when that, when I got caught there. And I look back at these things and I see them as, and I, and I feel bad for the people that I affected that were in my life and my family and what my actions did there, you know, but he carried me gracefully through, through all of it. Like he pulled me out of addiction. I didn't like have any kind of intervention to AA. There was just, I, I kept going back to, to meth times and times again, I'd like get clean for like two weeks on my own or a month at a time or a month and a half. And then I would always just find my way back in. And then the, the last time I 
tried to get clean. There was just a moment when I was in my apartment and I found a loaded pipe in a jacket that I was cleaning. I had been, you know, clean for a couple months at that point. And I just like lit it and looked at it and was like, whoo, and there it goes. And, uh, Lord said, you're done. I didn't know him personally at that point, but he, he said, you're done. And I just went and took it, threw it in a sock, stepped on it, threw it away, slumped up against the, um, the kitchen wall and just cried for a little bit. Um, and that, that was the last time I ever touched this stuff. I had dreams for years afterwards about relapsing, but he just said, you're done. And you've, you've, you've gone through that. Now look at how much life better your life is going to be. And same thing with prison is like, you're in here, you're going to make the most of it. You're going to get real healthy. Um, you're going to really appreciate your family. You're going to really appreciate being able to walk up to the people you love and not have a wall between you and them. Um, and so all these things that, that happened or even the, the moments that he just barely pulled me through, you know, in the time being like super high on meth with hanging out in the neighborhood. And like, at one point it was getting a little nuts and people were headed into the, the neighborhood. And my job was to sit on the side of the house with a shotgun. And if anybody that was coming out over pulled out a weapon, I was, I was to shoot them. That was my instruction. And that's wow. where I was right there, but nobody pulled out a weapon. Thank God. Cause <laughs> my life would have been a whole lot different. Um, but just different stuff like that. And he takes me at this like, and all the, the while, you... and all the while during this time you were married. No, no. Um, okay. I was married for the, the prison thing, but I wasn't married during the meth or all, all the crazy stuff growing up in that neighborhood. Okay. Um, no, that, I found, I met my wife in Hawaii. Um, so I wasn't through all of the, and I'm not even claiming that I know that I'm through the hardest stuff yet, but it seems like it, <laughs> It sure seems like it. Lord willing. Praise God. <laughs> Lord willing. That's the hardest stuff. I don't know, know what's going to happen with kids. You know, I got four kids. You never know how tough it could get there. Even sometimes just breakfast time, I guess, could seem a little tough when everybody's screaming at once. <laughs> but, <laughs> but even just now, like my baby was crying a little bit and I was like, God, thank you for this, this child. Just, Cause he immediately takes me like, imagine what it would be like without him. Imagine what it would be like if he wasn't here crying at, at, on your chest. And I'm like, no, 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 thank you. I'll take, I'll take the crying child. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So he, I feel like he moved me through all that stuff. Cause I, I know lots of stories from people and even heard them in prison, like folks that get to that low point where it seems like there's no way out. And then the Lord comes and scoops them up and says, you're going to live out. I have more for you than this here on this earth. And you're going to, I'm going to do it with you. I'm going to do it for you. And you're going to do it with me. Um, somehow what I think ultimately to his glory, he pulled me through all that stuff without coming to get me yet, without coming to have me know him while on earth. Um, and I think he knew that he, not, I think he knew, I know that he knows all of us personally, knows the hairs on all of our head and how many there are. Mm -hmm. Um, and he knew, he knew this about me that it would mean my relationship with him would mean a whole lot more if he waited, if I, if he waited to see me go through all that and, be in a place where I'm actually doing really well compared to the things that I had been through compared to the, you know, the, the molestation, the, the drug addiction, the, the, the prison, the, all the, all the dark stuff to have that to compare to, and then have a beautiful wife and be raised in a beautiful, beautiful family in one of the most beautiful places in the world and have that to look at and be like, yeah, that, wow, we're doing so much better now. Remember, remember that, remember that? Wow. This is like heaven on earth compared to that. But when he came to get me, the the disparity between or the difference of all of those dark things in my life and the space of having a beautiful family, um, the distance there was not nearly the distance of having that beautiful family without him, but or having that beautiful family with him in my life. It's like mm -hmm. an immeasurable difference, which is if you don't have a relationship with him, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But since you do, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When, when he comes into your life, it, it changes everything. Your perspective is, I mean, it's life changing. You're born again. You, you are, you be, start becoming a new creation. And all those sound like just like churchy Christian terms, but that's, there's a reason those terms I think exist and are spoken a lot because it's, it's just our shortcoming of language to really explain this glory that has been introduced into our life, this goodness that supersedes the world we know and gives you a glimpse into heaven, the world that exists outside of this physical broken world that we're in at the moment. Um, 
so yeah, I had gone through all that. I we we're living here. I had um, you know, our, our kids and we're walking around the neighborhood sometimes. And I, I remember we walked by a Tascaro Bible church one time, just on a family walk. And I said to my wife, Oh, maybe we should check out a church sometime, which sounded crazy coming out of my mouth because I <laughs> always thought like, you know, church was like full of hypocrites. And, uh, and it was just like, I was definitely not like looking to become part of any religion or, or anything like that. I, that, that was never, you know, I, I would give respect to it and stuff. Like I'd talk, t- have some conversations with people sometimes, but I was, it just wasn't me, you know? Um, and so we never did actually like shortly after saying that we didn't actually go to check out a church i just it was just a random thought that i spoke out loud yeah. one time but he heard me of course um and so other people would come into my life my buddy garrett being one of them it was kind of like a, a divine appointment i would say he's another reptile enthusiast guy that lives on the other side of the country um and i was at a reptile shop down there in southern california called prehistoric pets you've probably seen some of those animals on, on Instagram, because my buddy Jay down there who runs that place, like does collaborations with all the huge guy and Mike Tyson or, you know, any, any mm. huge like celebrity you can think of, they probably interact with Jay's mm-hmm. animals. Um, but I was there at his place about to go to my very first big reptile show outside of this state. And one of the bigger ones in Chicago. And there's this guy that works there named Tim O'Reilly. And he's kind of like a salt of the earth type of dude, like, like fog, not fog on leghorn, <laughs> Sam Elliott. He reminds me of Sam Elliott. Mm. And, uh, he found out I was going to that show in Chicago and he was like, Brian, you're going to that, you're going to Chicago. My Garrett's going to Chicago. He's like, I think you guys need to meet you guys. You should meet Garrett. He's going there to that show. And he walked me over to this picture and showed me a picture of all these guys holding this huge Python out in front of the store points to one of them. He's like, that's Garrett right there. You got to get a hold of him and tell him, tell him Tim said that you guys need to meet. I was like, okay, all right, Tim, yeah, I'll, I'll check him out. He's like, no, 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 pull out your phone. Go on. And he's like, made me like, look him up on Facebook and send him a message right there in front of him so that he knew that I had reached out to Garrett. And then, and uh, and so I said, okay, okay, Tim, Hey, Tim O'Reilly says we need to meet in Chicago. And then (laughs) Garrett replied, he's like, all right, well, if Tim said, so I guess we better do it. (laughs) And we meet We're like, we're just become fast friends. Like he's one of my best friends to this day. But the thing that's special about Garrett in that moment is that he was the first person that I met who was Christian and was living it in a way that I was like, Oh, is this what it looks like to be Christian? You just like are super awesome and love everybody and take care of them. Like you're your family, even though you just met them. Like that's, that's pretty cool. I like that. I like this Garrett guy. Yeah. And, uh, and then, so that, that was one of the first things where I was like, huh, I started asking him a lot of questions. Like why Jesus Garrett? Like why, why, what is it about Jesus? You know, tell me we'd be sitting around having campfire talks, you know, outside of a hotel or whatever. And uh, he would talk stuff about, to him about me. You know, sorry, he would say things about Jesus to me and like explain to me why he believes in in Christ and like all his different reasons. Um, so that kind of prepped me for, I think what I know what the Lord was doing. I keep saying I think, but when I know what His plan is, it's like it's no longer think. It's like you know, God has ordained this just like because He's sovereign over everything. Um, there was a girl that was local in the church here she's she's in idaho now but she had been praying about where the first place she was going to live away from her parents was going to be at 21 years old and it ended up being right on the other side of this wall right here attached to this house there's a studio that's attached to this house and that's where she moved into was right there super nice girl Brittany, Brittany tierney and uh one day we were finally going to hang out because we see each other in passing. She's like, Oh, I'm going to a Bible study. I'm going here. I'm going there. And we always just kind of be like, she was passing. Like, oh, one day we got to hang out and like talk and meet each other and stuff and like have dinner. Like, okay, cool. Thanks neighbor. Super friendly girl. And uh, one day she was trying to figure out how to get power to her shed. And I, I went down to go help her. Hillary's like, she's trying to, my wife said, Hey, Brittany needs some help with something else. I said, oh, cool. Go down there, start chatting. And she just had this presence that for whatever reason, I, I was just super comfortable with like, we could, we didn't figure out the power thing, but we did figure out that, that I had things I needed to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Poor girl just like was the best ear. Cause I spent, like I said, most of my life, like being quiet, not sharing too much, always listening. I'm very good at listening to people and hearing what they're going through. Not so good about doing that with myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but this girl provided that presence big time to where I was like getting emotional sharing some of my life. So I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm telling you this stuff. And and it became a Damascus Road type of moment where I'm like weeping and she starts glowing. And at that point, I'm kind of thinking, oh, man, I've I've just done too many drugs. Uh, <laughs> and, and then I tell her, you know, this poor girl in my mind, I'm like this poor girl. Like, I'm like pouring my heart out to her. And I'm weeping, girl, man. And she's just like, 
I, I'm thinking like, why, why am I putting this all on this poor girl? And when I told her that she was glowing, she said, oh, without even skipping a beat, without even like thinking, oh, this is so weird. She just said, oh, I just want you to know that's, that's not me. That's Jesus working through me right now. That's what that is. Didn't even. That's touch. amazing. That's yeah. amazing because that have the same thing happened with me. Um, but in reverse, I right after I got saved in two thousand nine, um, maybe, maybe a few years into it, um, I was with my assistant at the time doing production design, and um, we we ran into an old kind of an old acquaintance of mine, a gay guy, this gay guy who I actually, he was, he, he, I did a job for his company, a production job. And so he saw me and he's like, Oh, Beckett, how are you? Like, you know, and I was like, and I told him my whole story. I was like, Oh my gosh, I met Jesus. And like, I'm a Christian now and like, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I don't live that life anymore. And, and, um, he said, after I told him the story, he's like, he's like, you're, you're glowing. And I'm like, really? And I was like, well, that's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I get the glowing thing, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I love that. Um, wow, I I I was it's a good prayer of mine as was that maybe one day I would glow for somebody else and they would come to know the mm -hmm. Lord. That. that would be that would be cool. Um yeah, and then so she immediately you know asked if she could pray for me and and did so. And um and then after after praying for me, she said she was encouraged, she's like, you should really come to our our church and check it out. And, um, I'd love for you to meet our pastor, pastor Brandon and, uh, have a talk conversation with him. He's like, he's got kids your age. And like, I just think it would be good for you to do that. And, you know, at this point I'm like, well, you, you, whatever you say, like you just, yeah, I, I will do whatever you tell me to do right now. <laughs> wow. Um, because when she said that was Jesus, like the only thing I could think is, wow, that makes so much sense. Uh, and I don't know even know why it made so much sense, but I was like, that makes perfect sense. Um, and, and so I went to go to the church, you know, and I, I was like singing the songs and just kind of went by myself to check it out. And, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that was it. That was how it happened. I went there. And um, did you go, how soon after that experience did you go to the church? I think it was, I think it might've been that sun, that following Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It very well could have been. I've probably got the the footage. Wow. I should look at, I've got a Nest Cam. I wonder if I had the Nest Cam out front at that point. That'd be cool to go back and look at her having that conversation with me. If so. Anyway, <laughs> um, it was, it wasn't too long after I went, you know, and I was hanging out for the service and then, um, you know, I, I checked it out by myself and, and just did that. And then I was leaving, walking away. And, and then and you like, went by yourself. Yeah. I went by myself. Um, and then I was, I was leaving the service, walking out of the parking lot and you know, like that song, uh, love chase you down the pa pastor Brown. He's like, he shouts out, Brian, Brian. Like, Oh, Hey, he's like, Hey, Brittany says we need to talk. And I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, she said she said that to me too. <laughs> He's like, well, when when are we gonna when are we gonna do it? He's like, we just like, oh, here's my number, and we'll we'll set up time to get some lunch or something. Um, I was like, all right, cool. And so you know, he reached out again at some point, and we we went sat down to have lunch, and he just, I was like, all right, here we are, we're just having lunch at the Thai Elephant. That was September 29th, 2021, and uh, he just laid out the gospel for me, plain and simple. You know, like, I don't think anybody had ever really done before. He says, Pastor Brandon, if, he, if you ask him today, he'll say that he came in at like 7.7 because his, his like fact or his factoid or like statistic is that on average, people need to hear the gospel about eight times before they, they come to the Lord. So he says he came in, at, he says he came in at 7.7. .7. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're just having lunch and he, he was just explaining it to me. You know, he just, he's just real good at, at just like breaking it down and knows his Bible, you know, back of his hand and basically anything I was saying, my big thing was like, this sounds good. Like what you're saying sounds good. And I've just got so much work that I think I need, I've got like stuff I need to work on myself. I've got all this stuff, you know, I need to process through myself before I could like really accept that. And he just, he was like, well, yeah, you could spend the rest of your life working and it'll never be enough to be holy or to be, to, to get what, what it is that God's offering. It'll never be enough. You, you could, you'll never do enough work. Um, he said, cause it's a, cause it's a gift. Cause it's a free gift that he's, he's offering and it's either you accept it or you reject it. And there's no work that can be done for it. It's just, it's just accepting the gift or, or rejecting it. He says, so what do you, what do you want? Do you, do you want to accept it or no? 
And I was like, well, like, yeah, I, mean, I want to accept it. <laughs> you put it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do want to accept it. And he's like, all right. Um, and he, he prayed for me. He had, he had me repeat some words for him. And then like you were talking about when, um, it, yeah, when you, when you were praying for healing, when you had like, you had some physical stuff going, I think it was, you're talking with Tom yeah. about like somebody's praying for you and you know, like the tingling and like fell out oh, yeah. through head and like that started happening to me. I was thinking about that while you're telling that story. Cause that started happening to me right there at lunch. Like, and I was like, Oh, wow. I can like, I could feel it. And I was like, Oh yeah, I can see it. I was like, how can you see that? <laughs> How can you see what I'm feeling? I, I still don't, I'm not sure how how that all worked, but um, yeah, he from that that moment on, uh, I I had accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and as God and of my life. I came wow. home to tell my wife, and yeah, what did what was her reaction? It was like Sarah. It was like she just she just like laughed at me. She was like <laughs> she, she's like what? she's like what do you mean? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did you, she know did... you were going to the that church service that day? Or yeah, you... she knew I was going to check out church. Yeah, um, she. I don't know if she knew. I told. I think I even told her I was going to have lunch with the pastor. You know. Um, okay. But but she didn't know that. I guess what I was going to do is come home and say that I had accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> And so she was kind of like, she laughed because she's, you know, known me for however many years before that, you know, good 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, whatever it was, long time. And she's like, I just, you didn't like ask me first or like, to, she's like I don't, she wanted to like, I don't know how to process this. And she did apologize. Like just later that evening, she's like, you know what? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have laughed at you. Like that wasn't cool at all, but I just, that, it doesn't, I don't know what to do with this right now. And I said, I, I'm sorry or not sorry, but I just like, I, yeah, sorry. Um, that's, that's, this is what it is. And he immediately gave me this patience of like, you don't need to try and convince your wife or convert your wife. You just need to be gentle with her and just ask gentle questions and listen to her. And he just gave me this patience that was well beyond myself. Because once I think I figured something out, I'm like, you need to know about it <laughs> and you need to know about it now. And I'm going to explain to you this. Here's why, yeah. here's this. And so he just gave me the opposite of that. It was like, just be gentle with her. I've got, he, he had a plan. The next day, she's walking around the lake park with another mom whose kids went to the same school and they drop them off and go have their little mom walk around the lake. And so she's processing with this girl, with this lady about, you know, what I had come home and told her the night before. And she didn't know. But what God knew was that that girl was leading worship at a church service that had started because COVID had shut down most of the churches and this group of families started meeting in the park holding their own church own church service so they could meet together in person mm -hmm. and have to do virtual church and this girl was leading worship at that gathering and so she was like oh that's really cool like you you guys should come to our service this Sunday <laughs> and check it out and that was God's just like most beautiful soft landing blankets a literal blanket in a church amongst a group of families who were living out God's love in a very real here on earth life way for long enough for my wife to come to know the Lord through that. And accept. now she's like, she's like the only person I follow on Instagram. I follow a bunch of people on Instagram, but she's the only one I actually like click on her stories because they're always like, you know, it's my wife and I, I love her and there's always cool stuff, but she's always sharing scripture and stuff like that just as it comes to her. And it's just so cool to watch and so cool to see how organ organically like that, that happened and just how like the Lord was like, don't worry about your wife, dude. <laughs> We've got it right here. Yeah. yeah. So how long was it from when you came to Christ and then when she did? Was it just like it, a couple of days or like? No, it was. She has. She's not. She's not like one to just do something because I'm doing it and 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 stuff like that. Like she's she's not just gonna do that. Um. So she asked all her own questions and and she had lots of questions and I still have questions. So I think we should always have questions. I think they're good because we end up doing the iron sharpens iron thing and and mm -hmm. start to know more and more through through working out through his through his word together and processing stuff huh? but so i think it was a it was a few months i think yeah a few months not not a couple of days but like a a time of like coming and meeting with those families but it was just so undeniable like how real god's love was especially as you know these, these, this group of families going through the word together on sundays with all the kids running around in the park and and just like it was just so it was just so real. It was so non-religious as the, I don't know how best to describe it. It was just, it was just 
I, every time I think about it, it was just God's way to like give that gentle landing spot so that I wouldn't have to do the work and I wouldn't have to like try to beat her over the head. And he was just like, it's going to be through this love that I'm showing through these families that she's going to figure it out. Okay. I got it. <laughs> That's awesome. And so what, and what did your kids think about all this? Um, I remember the first time that my son, no, I didn't, we, you know, we started going to church. Of course, we started going to the, the church that, that, um, called life community church that pastor Brandon, um, leads and going there for a bit and the you know, kids would go to Sunday school and we we're sitting in the line at in and out one night with my oldest Noah. Um, that's another way that God like randomly showed up in, in our story, like for, for whatever reason, not because I was Christian because we weren't yet. Um, my oldest son is Noah. My second oldest son is Eli just seemed like the right names. <laughs> um, that's awesome. <laughs> and so he, we're, we're planning the plan is we're having our one of our daddy you know son parties like everybody else is asleep we're going to come back and like play card games and go get in and out and and we're sitting in line and i'm thinking about man we're just gonna go back we're gonna eat this in and out go back and like play cards and stuff and like is that really like good enough for what we're gonna do is that is that meaningful enough um as literally as i'm thinking that he just pipes up from the back seat goes dad i'm really glad we became christian and i was like Wow. Okay. What? Why? Like, can you tell me why? And he, I don't. I don't honestly remember what it was he said as to why. But I was it, for his. I think it was, it was nine at that time, or his ten year old. Uh, I was like, yeah, that's that's a good reason. I'm not gonna argue with you on that one. And I was like, well, it's funny that you say that because I was thinking maybe instead of playing games when we go back to the house, we could like go through some Bible verses and stuff. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I was like, who are you? Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> um. So I actually had the absolute privilege of. Uh, being able to baptize with the exception of the baby, I've got a one year old, so we're, um, we'll probably do a dedication for him at some point. But, um, on this past Easter, I got to baptize um, my wife and my three of my kids. Um, my daughter made a decision last summer at vi vacation Bible school that she wanted to follow Jesus, and then, um, my other son was you know kind of right behind my oldest son, and so it was really cool. I got baptized first by actually. <laughs> think about it like how this all worked out i wasn't like looking like oh i need a special thing to get baptized i was just kind of letting the lord lead you know just like whenever you think i need to go underwater i'm sure you'll figure it out for me i'm not going to like look too hard into it and he was always like okay that's fine i got how, how about the uh the father of the lady who helped bring your wife to a beautiful church how about that guy he'll be in town on easter he'll baptize you you good with that i was like yeah that's the, yeah let's do that <laughs> and and mike is just such a solid man in Christ. I just like one of those guys that I just love talking with him about Jesus because it's never boring, not even close. It's like, well, let's come on. Mike. I could sit and talk with Mike probably for eternity, which is, that's that cool <laughs> thing about heaven. Right. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, figure out who God is for the rest of time. Um, but so he baptized me and had a beautiful prayer. And, and, and then right after I, I baptized the rest of them. Um, and so that's where we're at right now. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. And so um so do you and and now with the with this the re, this what do you call it? Is that reptile or snake stuff? With that it's reptile, yeah, reptile snakes, the lizards and you know, uh, yeah. So tarantulas find their way into that somehow too. <laughs> so so um do you use that kind of sometimes as a because I know you have a YouTube channel. What by yeah. the way, what's your YouTube channel? It's just what my name. It's Brian, just Brian, yeah, Brian Cusco. We'll put it in the link. Uh, we'll link it to uh, below. But um, so do you? Do you now kind of use that as a platform too, as well to to talk about you know Jesus and? So my buddy Garrett, um, that I talked about from Pittsburgh, he would tell me that you know there's probably like two or three openly Christian people in our industry in our hobby, and I'm like, oh, that seems crazy but also not i guess <laughs> yeah um, and there was a time and he told i don't remember when he told me that but i was reading this book one night in a hotel room with my folks called the real god and at the end of chapter three of this book the author invites you to close your eyes for three minutes and ask god to talk to you this is very shortly after i was saved very shortly after and i'm reading this book and i i'm like okay i will close my eyes and i will ask god to speak to me and it was i was waiting for i was 
expecting to like take some time and have like a little bit of meditation and like because the author says you know give it three minutes or whatever and i was like all right here we go i close my eyes and he's like bam he's like why don't you talk about me in one of your youtube videos tomorrow how does that sound <laughs> like, oh <laughs> i was like wow i was expecting you to come in the second i close my eyes yeah. but okay yeah. i can do that and thankfully i had been in you know in the word enough at already at that point you know studying with brandon and going to bible study and, and reading through stuff to where i knew what to expect when i did that which was a good amount of pushback you know mm-hmm. plenty of plenty of you know not not just pushback but it was good stuff too but there was definitely plenty of like Blah blah blah, Sky Daddy. I'm unsubscribed. You know, blah blah blah, like all all this stuff of like, you lost me. You know, like wow, I, what you talking about anymore? Can't even take anything you say seriously at this point. And so there's a lot of that. Um, but I knew that it was coming because the Bible says it will. Uh, and so I was okay with it. And I've I've done stuff like that. Can I? There's two things that I'd really like to share with you. Do you mind if I share the first time I got to share my testimony? Yeah. I was praying with this group of guys at the church right here by the house. Um, this this guy Greg puts together, and Tom was part of it too, actually. That this uh, it's uh, what's the group name? It's basically the entrepreneurs like coming together to uh, see how God's kingdom was going to work in whatever secular work they were doing. And there's guys that like work for Apple, guys who are like fruit farmers, just all different places of work mm-hmm. coming together to pray about how God is going to how God's kingdom is going to show up at our places of work or how our work is going to build God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so we're praying with this group that morning very fervently. And I say fervently because I know when prayer, prayer happens fervently for me, at least this same feeling that I had when I was like waiting for Santa Claus, when I was five years old, comes back with this physical feeling of like floating teeth. And I, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but something like that. It was like, feels like my teeth is trying to float. And that happens pretty much every time prayer becomes fervent. That's how wow. I know it's like a sign. It's like, okay, this is happening. <laughs> and and uh, that morning, so I left that prayer group and I drove to Turlock, California, which there's a company that I work with up there and, and produce their YouTube channel. And I show up there and it usually takes me about, actually on that drive, I also listened to the, um, the video of you talking to the gentleman who was smashed by the semi-truck. I was, oh, right, yeah. yeah. I was listening to that on, on that drive, the last time I went on that drive, but... But, but this time, I just thought of that because was, I had some really crazy moments listening to that while driving there. Um, but this time, I was after that prayer meeting, driving there, get there. And usually, it's really tough to get the uh, the guy who runs the company, Jesse, in front of the camera and get things going. So I got to warm him up. And then he's really busy doing stuff. So like getting back to the camera after he's trying to put out all these fires over here. He's like, I know, but we got to get these videos done. I'm here. I drove three hours. Let's Let's get this done. And I usually don't make it home till like 10 o'clock maybe midnight after one of those sessions, whatever reason this time he was just ready. We knocked out a bunch of videos and I was like going to make it home for dinner, which has never, ever happened once. And I was super happy. Obviously I was like, this is great. I'm done. I'm packing up my stuff. And the girl, Julie in the office says, Brian, there's these guys outside. And this place isasn't like a storefront. It's just a warehouse, but their address is on Google. So people sometimes randomly show up wanting to check out what they're building. And they're like, sorry, you can't like even come in for liability purposes. You have to kind of, you just have to leave. And um, some people had showed up there doing just that. And Julie asked me if you wouldn't mind talking to these guys, they're here looking for blood python enclosures. And you know, if you could please talk to them before you leave, it'd be great. And I was all happy. Like, I'll talk to whoever you want. I'm going home. <laughs> I walk outside and one of the guys looks at me. He's like, Ryan Cusco, what are you doing here? which to me wasn't crazy because I'm a reptile guy and I'm on YouTube and some people show up to a reptile related facility. It's not crazy that they know who I am. But what he said next was, I showed one of your videos in our church in Iowa last week. It is, you don't understand how crazy it is that you're standing here right now. And after he told me the story of how hard he tried not to be there that day, he was like, I was obviously God showing him. He, not only that, but he was with a pastor. He works with this group called Converge, um, Pastor Marlon Minx. And he was visiting with one of his pastors from a sister church. And the pastor from his sister church is at a church one block away from where I was born. And these two pastors are there at my place of work, sent by God so they could pray over me in the warehouse while I wept uncontrollably (laughs) with forklifts driving around. (laughs) Wow. That was hours after praying. How is God going to show up at work? Uh, And I, I... at that moment, I was like, wow, dude, like how, how amazing are you? 
you know, like, is this just, this is just a glimpse of like how amazing you're going to be, isn't it? And that was the first time I got to share my testimony. He, he made me believe like, I really want to, I'm going to fly you and your family out to church in Iowa. I want you to share your testimony out there. And like, I was like, my wife was like, they're not flying our whole family out there. There's no way you can go and maybe Noah, but he's not paying for all of us. I was like, okay, that's fine. But yeah, he, he flew me and my oldest out, which was a great trip for the two of us and great for my son to be able to experience all that. And just, it was also really cool for me, somebody who grew up very introverted to be able to just share so openly with a bunch of strangers in a new land, you know, mm -hmm. Iowa. And that this is one of the, one of the really cool stories, but there's so many, you know, of how he's shown up in the last couple of years and just through the things that through the smallest little things, you know, sometimes it's just like something that you wouldn't even think about, but then you choose to follow a little breadcrumb that he laid on the ground for you that day and be like, well, what's that? And what's going to happen next? Like, what if I let you interrupt me here? What if I, pull away from my work just for that half a second long enough to not feel like I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm doing what I'm and see what, what he wants. Cause every time I've done that since I was saved, every, every time I've done that, since I've come to know Jesus Christ, every time I, I look to where he wants me to go, he's just like, see, it's, it's going to be like this it, little pockets of heaven open up every time, every single time. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, isn't life so much more uh, exciting when you're living it with Christ? I mean, it's, yeah, it's just like, it's so every day is like an adventure and it's so, and I, you know, I live here in LA and West Hollywood and like every time I get to share the gospel with somebody on, you know, on the street or wherever, like I just get, I just feel, I, I just, it's like such a thrill to me. I'm like, I'm so excited to shit that it's like my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> and so, um, praise God that he saved you and your family. That's amazing. Yeah. And, we actually uh, have things popping up in the, in the industry. Like, uh, I don't remember exactly how or when it happened. It was one of the Pomona shows, one of the shows down in the LA uh, County fairgrounds. It's one of the bigger shows in the country. And we had a little, just, I put out, you know, let's meet up and like get in the word anybody who wants it. Cause once I put out that first video on my channel, like saying that I had, you know, given my life to Jesus. Um, and I sing worship songs on there sometimes too. And just like, you know, just try to, I'm always asking like, how do, how am I, how do I do this Lord? Like, I don't want to just like try and beat people over the head through the video. Cause I don't think that's going to work. And he's constantly reminding me, just do, just live for me. And in whatever way that looks, you don't need to be like specific. You don't need to quote certain verses. Just do what you do. But because of doing that, people came out of the woodworks in the reptile industry and in the, in the hobby, you know, like those two to three pe people that were publicly Christian in the reptile hobby became like 30, 100, you know, like we have services now at shows. We have Sunday morning, we oh, at the amazing. place people lining it up. We, we sing worship songs and we read scripture and we pray and we invite everybody who wants to come and we're doing another one in Denver next weekend where the guys actually said they wanted me to not, not only like, is it gonna, cause it's been a side thing. Like the show doesn't say like, hold your service here. We just kind of do it. But this show is saying, Hey, we really wanted you to come, especially because you're having services now at these reptile shows. And we want to do that at our show for our very first one. So really cool. That's Super awesome. Cool. That's awesome. Wow. Well, that that's uh praise God. I mean, praise God for his mercy and his grace and the gift of salvation. And thank you for Brian, for coming on and sharing your story with us. That's yeah. Thanks for letting me talk so much. I, I never did that growing up. It's so <laughs> no. nice. To share. Thank you for providing the space, man. Thank you for your boldness of faith, creating a channel dedicated to doing this. I think it's so beautiful and so important. Like, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Well, if I, God, it was all God, it's all God, but yeah, thank you for coming on. And um, guys, we will see you next time on the show. Thank you.